or what? Yeah, I remember I read over the questions and there was one like that, the, the, the wording I thought was significant. It was about the need for nonviolent direct action to pressure governments and corporations to make policy changes. And I thought, I, I, I do very much appreciate nonviolent direct action, but its purpose is not to pressure, not to pressure governments and corporations, because they're not actually going to be very scared of your nonviolent direct action. But there are other causal principles in this world that we need to master if we're going to change the ship, the direction of the ship of state. And if we rely only on, see, pressure is an interesting, it, there's a metaphor embedded in that word. It's a physical metaphor. It's, it's pushing. Um, it's a force-based concept. And it kind of it, it envisions the world, it conceives the world as uh, a um, contest of various pressures. One's pushing it this way, one's pushing it that way. And if we can maybe exert a little bit of pressure this way, it'll turn this way. And I think that that's a recipe for failure because if, as we, and I'm not saying that we should never fight, never use legal, you know, um, go into legal actions or whatever, but we can't only do that. And I'm, I'm, I'm inspired right now to share a story I heard from a, a Korean activist. Um, he was known as Bao, his name was Bao. I heard the story many years ago. He was, he had been a, um, a, a, a radical anti-imperialist protester in Korea in the 80s, uh, protesting the military, U.S. military occupation and so forth, uh, you know, like throwing bricks and Molotov cocktails and like really, I mean, there were, there was a very, very militant um, segment of the Korean uh, left movement. And he got, you know, arrested by the secret police, tortured, and put in solitary confinement. And he was permitted um, one hour a day of exercise in the prison yard. And had, had the only contact with other living beings he had was with the weeds in the prison yard and with the uh, um, flies in his cell. And he, he, he said he learned to play with the flies. And he became, in that cell, he became an ecologist. And he, he in the yard, he, had, he was given pencil, a pencil and a notepad, and he drew pictures and wrote little poems and little thoughts about the weeds and sent those to his friends, you know. So finally, there's an amnesty in the 90s or something, and he gets released. And he finds out, he exits prison to find out that his letters to his friends have been compiled into a book called Weed Diaries, which is a bestseller now. <laughs> and he's all of a sudden wealthy. So, he, you know, he buys a farm and stuff, but he continues to be a um, activist. But he, in, in, in prison, he realized that the violence that he experienced mirrored the hatred and violence that he was waging against the world. And so he became a nonviolent protester. So there was a uh, U.S. naval base that was being built at the site of a thousand-year-old village that was going to be destroyed. And so he decided that he was going to stop this from happening. And he went there and he began doing this bowing meditation all day, every day, in silence. No placards, uh, no, one, no, no obvious indication of what he was doing and why, but he just kept doing that. And people understood and they started joining him in silence, in this um, prostrating meditation. And it turned into this mass movement and the media became aware of it. And the project ran into all kinds of snags. And he said, we would have prevailed except that then the violent protesters came in, hijacked our movement. And once they did that, then the media and the government knew what to do. They because now it fit into their familiar paradigm, their familiar organization of the world into, you know, bomb-throwing anarchists, bad guys, and law and order, good guys. So I think that this might, I might offer this as a, as a principle and, and take it with a grain of salt. You know, I'm not very experienced in direct action, 
but maybe just something to think about, which is whatever you do, make sure it evades the ready categorizations that the establishment holds. They don't quite know what to do with you. They can't fit you into us versus them. Then you can uh, have an effect much greater than any kind of direct pressure.